This is the Conservative Czar, December 7th, 2012, to talk today about the conservative news that might be out in the press this morning. I want to start uh, with a talk about the fiscal cliff and uh, this reporting that has been going on, which I think is very accurate, that this is really down to two men, Obama and Boehner. And uh, it's like a, uh, a, a prize fight against a heavyweight and a lightweight, uh, to be honest with you. But, that's, but, but it's about these two people. And the path that negotiations take, the path that this whole thing will take is up to the minds of these two people. And whenever you're in a situation where, you're, where events are going to occur based on the thoughts of one or two people, it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen. Now, we really don't know what's in the mind of, uh, of Barack Obama. Uh, yesterday, uh, Bob Woodward, when asked what is the one thing that he would want to know about uh, what's going on in the negotiations, he said, I'd like to know what's going on in the head of Barack Obama because I don't know and I don't think anybody else does. And, and he's a mystery and it's very difficult to, to uh, figure out what his... Uh, where is where, where, where really his head is at? And John Boehner, we know a little bit more. He's a compromiser. He wants to compromise, and I he's, everything is set up for him to take a compromise. The issue is uh, it's very simple. Barack Obama knows this, knows he's a compromiser, knows he gives up early, and he is going to pound and pound and pound. And uh, it, it's uh, it's difficult to predict. If I had to guess right now that this is going to end up with a compromise heavily weighted in the fa favor of Barack Obama. But it's up to these two guys now. Uh, now, and one more thing about Boehner. Is it's up to Boehner as long as he has the support of the Republicans in the House. Uh, so far he does, and, and um, as long as he has that support, he has that power, and it's up to what's inside his head. Uh, so it's up to these two guys. very hard to predict what's going to happen, but it's a high, heavyweight against a lightweight. The second issue I want to talk about today is the passage in Michigan of the right to work laws. Republicans have gained ascendancy in Michigan's state house and governorship, and they passed a right to work law. I want to describe what a right to work law is. First of all, in most places and most jurisdictions in the United States, uh, we have uh, rules that state that if a, a union and a, a, bi a business sign a contract that demands that every employee join that union. It's part of the contract. The right to work law says that that, con that, that clause is illegal in that, and that in a contract between a business and a union, there cannot be that clause and every single employee must have a choice whether to join the union or not. That's the difference. I want to caution people a little bit about this. I've always, all my life, oppose right-to-work laws because it's a violation of the basic principle, freedom of contract between a union and a own, a owner of a business, to freely contract the terms of employment of that business. But in effect, what happens is the owner says, from now on, everybody who wants to work for me is going to have to join the union. That's in effect what the contract says. It's, it's freely given in a negotiation for a union contract. And when you pass a right to, law, right to work law, what you're saying is that the contract is, of, that we are going to pass a law restricting the freedom to contract. And that's what it is. And that's, there's no, no way around it. I've, I've basically opposed right to work laws for most of my life because of this violation of, of freedom of contract. I've, I've changed my mind in the last few years, and only because the unions have become such a political animal. So while there are uh, nuances to this thing concerning freedom of contract, future of the country trumps freedom of contract. And uh, so it, it, this is very important news. It's, it's just like it happened in Wisconsin, the same thing. Michigan is a very, very union state. It, it, I think the, it, it is true. If it happens in Michigan, it can happen almost anywhere. So this is a it's an important move for conservatives to get these right to work laws passed and and bring down the political power of the uh, Democrat Democrat controlled unions.
Thir a third story that came out, uh, we've had this uh, jobs reports come out, and there's conflicting things about the jobs report, uh, but, uh, but basically unemployment's at 77 uh, I think it created 146,000 new jobs. The news that came out of this was that in their calculations and everything else, in this 146,000, 73% were government jobs, new government jobs. Now, I'd like to know where the new government jobs are coming from. I mean, I, I, I you know, the, the, there is a, a hiring in the IRS. I, I understand that. But I thought we're cutting everywhere. I thought everything was cut, cut, cut. In, 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 and, and that's the dirty little lie here throughout the, the entire country. Of course, it's not cut, cut, cut. As we speak, government is growing. At every level, city, state, federal, it's growing. Might not be growing as fast as they would like it to grow because of in, the, in local governments and state governments, revenue is limited, but it's still growing. And that's the you know the, the and and it comes back to the seventy three percent of new jobs created in the last reporting cycle uh, were government jobs. And by that 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 is a that is a disturbing number to think that we're having a recovery, any kind of recovery, where most of the jobs being created are government jobs. It's very, very bad news. I want to shift gears for a minute to, to talk, uh, and I consider this to be the most important story of the day, and only because it's the most important issue confronting the United States. Domestically, well, not domestically. I mean, there are some... Yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to say domestically also, because the fiscal cliff is a huge thing, but that's going to amount to nothing, absolutely nothing. We're going to compromise ourselves into nothing. So I, I don't believe it's a big story. But Egypt is a big story, and I've tried to, to point out time and time again why Egypt is such a big story. And the story yesterday was that the military uh, stepped in for the first time. The story today is the military still there. Nothing has fundamentally changed except some reports that have come out that the, uh, the relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and the military is, uh, is in good shape. There seems to be, as I said all along, the issue in Egypt is, is the Muslim Brotherhood needs some time to consolidate power. The main issue in consolidating power is how the Muslim Brotherhood will co-opt the military. And it looks like that's what's happening. Uh, if, there's no question that if the military wanted to stop the Muslim Brotherhood today, they could do it. They could do it. Um, but, the, but all indications are every single day as we go further into this thing that, that uh, the, the military in Egypt, the last hope for a, a non-Islamist state in Egypt uh, is, is supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. And I've said this before, and bef before but I want to reiterate it. We, we, in the Middle East a few years ago, we had some stability. Uh, in Egypt, we had Mubarak, a pro-Western dictator of Egypt, whose sole point was to keep down the Muslim Brotherhood. He has been spending 30 years fighting the Muslim Brotherhood. The United States and the Arab Spring, Obama, Clinton foreign policy, gets a, turns his back on Mubarak, and we get the, the Egyptian revolution putting the Muslim Brotherhood in charge of Egypt. Egypt has the best army in the Arab Muslim world. And it, 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 that whole country, being Islamist, is of great danger to Israel. Now, I'm, I'm not, I care what happens to Israel, but the importance of it as an issue is about the United States. Because as Islamists grow in Egypt, grow in Syria, grow in Lebanon, now, now Lebanon is a, almost like a, a suburb of Syria. But as the Islamists grow around Israel, there will come a time when they will have enough power that they can fight Israel on more than even terms. And this is this inevitable war I keep talking about. And, and here is the problem for the United States and for us. You know, if this was an isolated incident, uh, a war between uh, some European countries uh, fighting each other, we, we'd have little concern. But it's not. 
we have deep military ties to Israel. If there's a confrontation, a major war, we are going to be involved from the beginning in support of Israel. But if the war stalemates or looks like Israel is having a hard time of it, the United States is going to have to intervene militarily. And, I, and, and the, the way this, the tea leaves are, are looking is that if this is let to go for a year or year and a half, as Syria falls to the Islamists, as Egypt, uh, Egyptian army becomes the Muslim Brotherhood army, the risk to Israel is enormous. The risk that we are going to get involved directly in the defense of Israel is enormous. Now we're in a situation where, where we're defending a small country against the entire armed region. And that's bad enough, but that's not the worst part of this. Russia has staked some claims to this area, especially in Syria. They're, they're supporting Assad. They've staked claims. Their involvement, or the Chinese involvement, the Chinese would love to be involved in this area. That, that threat, we're going to have a war. The United States is going to be involved, I believe, militarily. And the possibility that Russia and, and or China enter in is alarming and, and extends this danger exponentially. And we're now talking about the, 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 the two, two nuclear powers. One of them is huge, and that brings up another subject. We're seeing what I consider to be dangerous signals sent by the United States. In an article uh, that's today about Hillary Clinton attacking uh, Putin in Russia for his desire to have an economic union, like the European Union, of ex-Soviet states. And the Clint Hillary Clinton is, considers this to be an extreme danger. And, and this is what, this, this, so they're talking about this Eurasian Union that Putin is putting out there. And let's, let's hear what, this is a direct quote from Hillary Clinton. Let's make no mistake about it. We know what the goal is, and we are trying to figure out effective ways to slow down or prevent it, it being this, this uh, concept of a Eurasian Union. So the United States Secretary of State is laying the gauntlet down to, uh, for, to, to Putin. Now, Putin's not the best guy in the world, but he isn't the worst, and I don't understand this t total knee-jerk anti-Russian reaction that goes on in this country, and especially with Hillary Clinton. Now, put this in the context of an, of an all-out Mideast war where Russia already has a stake in it, and we're trying to prevent the establishment of a Euro, Euro, so-called Eurasian Euro, Union. We're interfering with the internal affairs of Russia in the context of an all-out Mideast war. This is a recipe for disaster with the only other major nuclear power in the world. It makes no sense to me. It makes no sense to me. This is a very, very dangerous situation, and, and, and that's why Egypt is so important. This is a very, very dangerous, dangerous situation, and, it, and it's dangerous to the people of the United States. This is the conservative czar, December 7th, 2012. See you next time.